Okay. I'm so glad that you agreed to do this. Yeah, I am too. Okay, so today um, I am going to interview Amber Lamott. She is the author, I hope you can see this on my camera when I put up, of Her Time to Speak. Oh, can you see it? Her Time to Speak. Uh, and I've read the book and I love it. I'm kind of fangirling on you. <laughs> so... Um, first of all, Amber, tell me a little bit about your background and where you're from. I know that you're from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So tell me a, a little bit about Amber growing up and your history before you are the beautiful young woman that you are now. Okay. Well, like you said, I, I am from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, growing up, I, I've lived in Baton Rouge, I've lived in Texas, and I've lived in Atlanta. When I was younger, I always loved to like sing. Um, I would write poetry or I would write songs in a book that I wouldn't want anybody to read at first. Um, and I just always loved like art stuff, things pertaining to the arts. Um, I'm a mother of two little girls. I have two girls. They are 10 and seven. And I'm from Louisiana. What are your girls' names? Their names are Christine and A. Marie. Okay. Yes. And I just pretty much have always loved writing poetry. Um, it was a, a hidden gift that I had that I would be afraid to show others. You know, like I said, I would write in a, in a notebook. I would write songs um, without like any music to it, but I always would try to hide it. But it's something I've been doing since I was maybe like in high school, um, writing songs, middle school or high school, writing songs. And I have siblings i come from a family where it's my mother my my mom wasn't married to my dad but um i had two siblings that were sisters with her and an older brother with with her and then with my dad i have two siblings a brother and a sister and i believe i get my gifts from my dad's side of the family because they are musical like my entire family on my dad's side, they can sing, um, they, they do musical things. They had a, a group, a quartet group, but I, I don't know if anybody else in my family really um, would write songs or poetry, but I'm the one in my family who likes to write poetry and I can write songs and I, I can sing as well. Um, but I believe I get my gifts from that side of my family. And it's just something that I've always loved, like poetry, music, songs, you know, writing it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so your book, it was very moving to, to me. It's, it's a collection of poems, the spoken word poems. And this collection is it's so raw and cleansing and empowering all at the same time. And it almost reminds me, you know, be, being a, a, a woman and, you know, going through kind of a lot of the same things. Um, it almost reminds me of a binge purge recovery type of situation, you know, and so how long did it take you to write this collection and what was your transformation process? Okay, so it really started when I was going to this church um, and the, the main location is actually out there in Chicago, but they have different locations around 
you know, the United States. So I was going to this church and I, I finally had gotten back into church um, to try to have a relationship with God. And some things happened at the church um, around that time. I was leaving my kid's father um, because it was a toxic, toxic situation. And when I was going to the church, he was also coming there. And it, it became a thing to where, because I was leaving him, um, I kind of didn't have help that I needed when I asked, you know, for the help, like trying to see how to put it. Um, he began going there. I was going to the church first and then he began to come. And then, um, you know, that he, he would kind of harass me like while, while at church. Um, and so things started to happen from that point uh, with my car breaking down, um, with just me having to leave my job. And with my car breaking down, I needed help. So I asked the church I was going to for help. Because, you know, when you're in church, you figure that because you're a member there that they will be willing to help. Well, it was it was some issues with that. It's like I could get help, but they were trying to do it under the guise of I had to ask, I had to um, have his permission for them to help me. And it was kind of like a spiritual abuse type of situation. And so. Um, when all of that happened. I just started to, I basically was losing everything at that point when I was leaving him because I had to leave out of that situation. It was toxic. And um, with me going through like a stripping, um, once I was in this place where I was isolated, I lost my car, I lost my job. I was working with a medicist because um, um, I used to have to use my car to get back and forth to my patients' homes. Um, now I, I would have had a car with the company, but they kept on pushing back when I would get it. And my car was breaking down at the same time as they had me traveling all over, you know, where I'm at. And so um, I ended up having to leave my job and then I lost my car. And on top of that, I was leaving him and I, it wasn't, what I had planned to do, I had expected to be with him, but it was a situation that I had to leave and get out of because it was it was toxic, um, like domestic violence type of toxic. And when I was treated, I felt like I had been um, treated unfairly with the church because I felt like they were being biased towards me because the fact that I was a woman, um, that they stuck more towards the male side when things like that would happen. And so when I needed help, people also, the pastor actually told other people not to help me unless they asked him, you know, and I just kind of felt oppressed in that situation, um, being that I really needed the help. Plus I had two little girls and he was being, complicated when it came to me getting the help from him but then I also had to sit back and watch them help him when he needed help with with the vehicle so it's like they left they like threw me to the side and they helped him and they were only willing to help me if I was to still be with him like trying to kind of force me to be in a in a situation that I didn't need to be in and so I went through a lot in that time. Like I was, I was grieving. I was feeling depressed. Um, I've written a poem about this. Um, it was really hard for me. Um, I had, you know, I was trying to get back to going to work. Cause at that time, my, my youngest, she was still a baby and I couldn't get daycare money, you know, from him to put her in daycare so I can go back to work. Cause my other child was already in school. And it was just a bunch of things to try to keep me down that he was doing to try to keep me down. And so um, as I was here and as all that, that began to happen with me losing like a lot of the things, I began to, you know, cry out to God a lot about the things that were happening to me. 
And I also began to like come back to what I love to do because when I first got with him, he saw that I wrote poetry, but I stopped. And then when that happened, it's like I began to write poetry because that was helping me get through that. It was like therapy kind of for me, uh, writing out what I was going through, um, the things I was experiencing. And I find that when I'm feeling something or feeling um, a certain way about something that I'm going through, that's when I write my best. And so that is what I began to do. I began to write poetry. I began to write um, just like daily, a poem daily. And I knew I wanted to make a book. At first I wanted to do like an ebook, but that didn't turn out the way that I thought it would. It was actually better. And so I just began to write daily. Um, and then I gathered all the poems that I had. And then I began to try to make a collection out of them, try to form them together. Uh, poems that actually like fit in the same kind of category. And some of my poems, they are just poems that I wrote. And some of them, some, some of them are poems that I actually have their experiences that I went through. Um, because I find that I can just write well in any, any way, like it doesn't have to be something that I actually went through, or it could be something I went through and I can still really write well, but that is what I began to do. I began to, um, you know, pray a lot. I began to get in my Bible a lot, um, when this happened, because it was kind of like a church hurt situation and it's, it all stemmed from that. And, I was just frustrated because I was expecting being going like being being a member of a church that when a crisis happened that I would get the help that I need but it didn't happen like that for me and I was upset I was angry for a while with how I was treated but eventually I got to a point where I began to like forgive those people and I realized that it had to happen what what went down um because it taught me a lot. It like, it helped me to find myself again. It helped my character. It helped me to, you know, be a better person. It helped bring out the gifts that I have um, even, even more. But that is what I did. I, I wrote poetry. I began to like pray and I worship, um, read my Bible um, and just talk to God about what I was going through, what I was experiencing. And I cried out to God a lot of times about the things that were happening. But I began to just write daily. And that's how I gathered my poems together for this book. And so that's pretty much it. And it made you strong. Yeah. You're very strong. And you're, you persevered. You know, you probably found strength that you never realized in a million years that you had. And yeah. you've become such a role model to your daughters and to all the students and faculty that are going to watch this interview. You know, you're, you're going to be such a role model. Now, there are a couple um, poems in the book that I've picked out and um, you may have them memorized because you wrote them or you may have your book with you I, and um, I don't know if you would um, recite them for us the first one is forbidden fruit and that resonated so much with me because mm -hmm. sometimes things look so good or so perfect but we know that what looks too good to be true is most definitely probably not. Right. And that there it's in the end, it's not going to work out well. Yes. So do you have that? Could you uh, read that for us and give us yes. some background on that? I will read, um, read it from the book. That's not one of the ones I've memorized. I find that some of my poems is easy to memorize others not so easy but um i'm gonna go to that page okay and so 71 
And when I wrote this, I'm trying to remember, I think this was just a poem that I wrote when I first started back writing my poetry, because like I said, I, ha I had got into a point where I just completely stopped writing poetry. Like I kind of buried my talents, my gifts. And then once all of that happened, I began to get back to who I knew I was like and, and what I love to do. And poetry is one of those things. So 71, okay. Forbidden fruit. Grab the page. Okay. They say the blacker the berry, the sweeter the juice. What's sweet about forbidden fruit? You're poison, even though you say you're a poison berry. From the outer appearance, I can distinctively see you're a Jerusalem cherry, too toxic for me. I consumed you and received an irregular heartbeat. I was deceived, expecting a corrupt tree to turn out to be something good for me. Devastated from your disloyalty, I felt the effects of your solanine. Sick to my stomach with gastrointestinal infections and cramping, I played the fool. These are the side effects of eating forbidden fruit. That is beautiful. And I think everybody can relate to that in one way or another, whether, yes. you know, in some way we, we can all um, relate to that. Yeah. And another one that really stuck with me was strings. Strings. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Yes. Yeah, strings is so I can say, even with everything that I was going through, sometimes when, you, when you're leaving a situation, people would think that you don't really, um, that you don't have any feelings about it. But whether it's a good situation or whether it's a bad situation that you're having to leave, at one point, when you were with this person, you cared about them. So. It's, it's like a grieving process that you have to go through um, that I was going through when I was writing some of these poems. Um, and it's just, I, I just was, I was just describing, you know, the emotions that I felt um, as well as with that poem, Strings. Let me go to it. Um, 86. How you will be with someone and they'll 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 make you feel like you like they want you for the moment, but it's just for the moment. Like it's like kind of like trying to see the correct way to describe this. Like, it's not real love, it's, it's a pseudo love. It's, it's like narcissistic, I can say. That's what the idea of this poem is about with strings, with the relationship that I have been in. Um, wanting you but then you know not wanting you at the same time or, or once you're finally able to detach from that person then they try to reel you back in but they really don't really you know really want you they're it's, wanting you for the benefits to use you things like that yeah that's where this this poem that's the direction i was going with this poem so it says strings, okay. She was the object of his affection, literally an object, how obnoxious it was. He thought he could just pick her up, play with her when he was bored, then put her away temporarily, yet still keeping her on his cord. Like the strings on a guitar, he played and plucked with her heart. And if her attachment to him began to loosen up, he quickly gave her a tune up. Yes. Yes. So what... Do you have a favorite in this book? Yes. Um, my favorite is 
my wilderness. That's my the next one on my list. It's, it's my testimony. That's what my it's a poem that I wrote as far as my testimony because when when the stripping happened, when I say stripping, I was losing a lot of things at once, and I was isolated, um, and and, and in a place where I couldn't really um, do much. And, and I'm I. I won't say that I'm completely out of that, but my mindset, um, where where my mindset is today versus then is different because I realize things happen a little bit at a time. Like I'm slowly having to rebuild um, to get back on my feet completely after leaving my children's dad. So this is titled My Wilderness because I that's how it felt. It was like a wilderness season for me where I lost everything, where it was really hard for me. Times was hard when it came to money, even food sometimes. Um, when it came to just taking care of my children, it was just hard getting the help that I need, getting people to help me without making me feel like I was being a burden to them when they knew the situation just different things and, and just, you know, feeling alone in the time where I really needed people, you know, when a time, a time when I was down. And so this is a part of my testimony. Um, I saved this poem for last in the back of the book because it was, it was my testimony. I wanted to end the book with my testimony. So this says my wilderness. They say seasons come and seasons go, but I've been stuck in the desert. There's no pleasure, only parched weather. Tumbleweeds is the only company rolling through. I'm in a desolate place. My own kindred has hidden their faces from me. I've been abased. I cry for help, but no one's listening. My name is dragged through the mud by my enemies. Who's defending me? Satan has conquered and divided. Used to be friends are seeming more like frenemies. In their eyes, I must be guilty, wicked, or filthy and think they have the right to judge me because they've seen my flaws, but won't do righteous judgment to those actually breaking laws. They see my condition and use it as ammunition to hurt me, being discouraging. The truth is the Lord brought me to a secret place, my wilderness, to be purged and planted, to become a tree of righteousness producing fruit with much tenderness. It hasn't been an easy process. I was almost overtaken by bitterness and unforgiveness. The Most High put me through the fire so I could be a witness. I realized this. To the cry of Joseph, I can relate. The way Daniel was left in the lion's den for dead, my life was at stake. Help was only an option through oppression. It was not up for debate. The, misog the misogyny became disgusting. I became distrusting of men that's supposed to be of God and of the bias. And frankly, my attitude from there on was, they can kiss my hot cross buns. I knew that wasn't how I should run. I wanted to give up. From the very moment I gave my life completely over to God, the warfare was tough. Where's the love? The Lord taught me a lesson. Quit looking for a blessing or affection from man. Trust in the one who have the power to withhold and to open his hand abundantly. Life confronted me for making flesh my arm. My faith was increased the further I got into my wilderness and I saw no harm. Everything I needed was provided. I confided in him first, believed, then streams of water flowed into my life. Right when I felt at my wit's end, every now and then he would throw in little blessings, filling me with hope I would keep pressing. He gave me a glimpse of my promised land, the plans he had for me, my peace, where evil and adversity must cease. My expected end, what a friend I have in Jesus. We must seek and search for him with our whole heart, the one with the power to make the Red Sea part, even start making ways in our wilderness. Rivers in the deserts, the measure of grace given to me is what helped get me through this place, my wilderness. It's so, beautiful. That was you. beautiful. So yeah, in, in 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 that poem, when I said um to the cry of Joseph, I can relate. My life, uh, my life was like Daniel. My life was at stake. Th those parts, so those come from the Bible, and I reference Joseph because, because I'm kind of, I, I relate to him a lot in the Bible. Um, so Joseph was a dreamer. I'm a dreamer. Um, I get visions. 
things like that. That's a part of my gifts. Um, and Joseph was thrown into a pit by his brothers and left for dead, but they ended up, he ended up being sold into slavery. And when he was sold into slavery into Egypt, he became a ruler in Pharaoh's house. Okay, so when he when he became ruler in Pharaoh's house and the famine was in the land, um, his brothers had to come to him to get food because there was a famine in the land and they didn't recognize him when they when when they finally came into contact with him, you know, years later after they did that to him. And so um, Joseph recognized them and he in the Bible, it talks about how he cried out when he when they came to him to get food. That is what I um, was referencing to by to the cry of Joseph. I can relate because I can imagine how Joseph felt when when people that did you wrong, you know, that just left you for dead, pretty much didn't care what happened to you out of envy, out of jealousy, come to you needing something. I can imagine how he felt in that moment because knowing when someone has done something like that to you, your first response would be to want to be like, no, I'm not helping them, you know, have that kind of attitude towards it because they've hurt you. And so I say to the cry of Joseph, I can relate because I've learned to forgive people. Um, it's taught me forgiveness, forgiveness being through this. I've learned to forgive the very people that have hurt me, that have tried to keep me down um, to the point where if they needed something, I would probably help them, you know, because that's just the kind of heart that I have, no matter what they've done to me. And I just relate a whole lot with Joseph in the Bible. Um, I, I, like I said, I can imagine how it is to have to help people because the guy has put you in that position to help them. Um, when you know that they have tried to get rid of you or they didn't care to help you, you know, that's how my situation felt with, with what happened with the church I was going to when all of this started, because that was the community that I had pretty much. And I, I didn't have that once I, you know, was isolated. I didn't have the community that I was used to having, the people that I was close with. He came in between those people with me. And that's what I meant by conquer and divide to where those people, the people that were close to me, they, they turned away from me. And so like, those were some really hurtful things that happened, but I learned to forgive them. Um, and so that's what I meant by, um, to the cry of Joseph, I can relate. But also in that poem, I, I mentioned, um, he gave me a glimpse of my promised land. So like I said, I'm a dreamer. And so I've seen certain things that's going to happen um, in my life, concerning my life. Um, this college <laughs> is one of them. I realized that like recently I saw myself like in several times in this in, in the environment of this college. I didn't know that it was the, co the college when I dreamed it, of course, but but that is how God would do things. Like he'll make things, he'll reveal them in time. But I realized that maybe a few years ago I did dream about being back in school being um at the time of the dream it was a place it, it, it looked like an administrative place a position that i was in in this building but i didn't know where it was but i knew it was not here where i live and so yeah and he showed me other things but i've learned to just wait for some of those things to come and and um you know, you know, not reveal it all too soon, but that's what I mean by to, jo to Joseph, I can relate. Um, and he showed me a glimpse of my promised land, you know, things that are going to help me move forward and, you know, walk out my purpose in life, you know, what he's called me here to do. So. Okay. All right. 
I, I just love your story. Um, you also have another book available on Amazon. Is that correct? Yeah, it's a journal. It's a journal for girls. Um, it's just basically something to help parents for little girls um, kind of kind of journal their thoughts, um, keep like keep them organized, you know, just something to help little girls get out their thoughts and their feelings. And, you know, I have a place in there where they can write what they've read in the Bible, you know, just to try to help guide the youth in a, in a positive way. Um, because I realized that that's what God has called me to as well, little girls or youth. So that is why I wrote that you know, but it's called a journal. It's, it's a Christian journal for girls. So yeah, I recently published that one just recently. Okay. Um, what kind of advice or what kinds, what steps would you have to advise other single parents attending school that that feel like they're just too overwhelmed or that they they just can't handle it all they 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 just can't handle the job and the children and school and it's just too much for them what what can you tell them i would tell them to take it one step at a time um i know not everybody has the same faith um, so, you know, I don't, I don't talk about my faith to push it on anybody, but, um, one thing that keeps me balanced is, is how I start my day with God. I start my mornings in prayer. I start them in like silence, reading the word because it helps me get through the day. Um, as I told you in the Cape meeting, I, I, I have anxiety, so, um, what helps me is when it comes to school is, you know, doing things like putting on relaxing music that keeps me calm, like classical music. Um, yeah, classical music, I would say, um, just trying to really stick to the schedule that you had us write out, um, in trying to manage our time wisely, that would help. I would also say to try to get your your household like in routine with you. Like for me, I I make sure that when my children get home, that they have everything they need um, and that they're fed, bathed, all of that, and then. I'll get back to my work, but I make sure that they're taken care of. And I try to do my assignments, my work, when it's the quietest, where I can concentrate. Um, that means like when they're asleep, sometimes sacrificing having to be up late at night or while they're at school. That's when I get the most of my work done. Um, I would also say, um, finding like a workout routine, um, aerobics exercises, because that helps keep down stress. And that's what I've done to help keep down stress um, and to deal with my anxiety. So I would exercise at least 30 minutes a day every week. Um, I have stopped a little bit, but I'm getting back to it. But I believe that that would help some of the mothers as well, because it would it would um, de decrease the stress and then just taking the time to get organized um, like a planner to write out when you have certain certain assignments due or when um, you want when you want to work on certain classes during the week that would also help um, That's pretty much it for me um, that I can say that would help. But the main thing is, is God for me. 
is having a relationship with God because I realized that I can't do anything in my own strength. So I, I start my day and I talk to God, I pray and I ask him to give me the strength to be able to do what I'm doing um, and to, to lead me and to guide me. And I push, I just push myself basically. Um, like this week, it's, it's been challenging, but I, a lot of it is going to require sacrifice. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people have not been been in school for a while mm -hmm. because I saw another post from one of my professors that people were complaining about those things. And that's how I felt as well. But I, I didn't send them an email. But I've also learned that to be successful with certain things, sometimes it takes sacrifice. So if that means having to stay up later than what you normally would to get those things done, then you have to be willing to put forth that effort um, so that you can get things completed and turned in in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's all that I have for that one. Okay. Your, um, your girls are still pretty young, but do you give them responsibilities? And if so, at what age did you start giving them little chores or responsibilities to not only help you, but to help them in their development? So um, Christine is 10 and A. Marie is seven. So I don't really make them do much just yet. It, it's starting to get there with Christine because She's in fifth grade. She'll be in sixth grade next year. But the only thing I require them to do is to clean their room. A lot of times she wants to help me. So I'll let her um, because she'll see when something is too much for me. So she'll do things like sweep the living room for me, uh, sweep her room, the hallway, clean the, li the living room, keep her room clean. And she asked to wash dish dishes, but I haven't let her do that just yet because of knives and things like that. And sometimes she wants to cook, but I told her I, I'm going to start teaching you how to cook soon. So she doesn't have to do much. The main thing is to clean her room is what I make them both do. Mm -hmm. And as they get bigger and older, then I'll try to, um, I'll try to divide, you know, different chores between them because that's what, what my mom did when we were growing up. We would have a list of chores we would have to do and it would be divided between me and my brother um, for each week and we will be responsible responsible for those things so um, that's what I'll probably do when I think that they're at a good age to do that okay all right now uh, this might be a little bit of a uh, a surprise request for you but you also sing Oh my now, gosh. <laughs> are you willing to give us a little sample before we go? <laughs> Do you have anything pre off, you know, prepared or, or that you could just kind of give us a little sample of your your beautiful voice? Okay. I get shy <laughs> when it comes to this part. <laughs> well, it's I'll just see. you and me here. <laughs> okay, so um okay i'll sing something this is a song by fred hammond the song is called um everything to me it's a gospel song so okay My future and my history, my freedom and my liberty, my strength, my joy, my life, my peace. Oh, Lord, you're everything to me. My flame, my light, my lamp, my heat, brighten my path to guide my feet, anoint my head and fill my cup, oh Lord, you're everything to me, everything to me, everything to me, 
everything to me, everything. When I felt lost and alone, you came and changed my story. The pages of my life you have revealed your glory. Lord, you're every, my start, my now, my close, my end, the lover of my soul, my friend, oh Lord, you are my everything, my Father, God, my Lord and King. You heal and cause life to increase. You are the cure for my disease, my purpose and my destiny. Oh Lord, you're everything to me, everything to me, everything to me, everything to me. Everything to me everything and that's all i have because i'm nervous that was beautiful thank you so much that was that was beautiful that thank was you. Just, that was so beautiful so i'm gonna